uh, that if you've not already informed us that you should do so now. Uh, we have one at the back. Very well. Um, contributions to the meeting will be timed as per the email I sent out before. Um, and so you will see that via the, uh, the uh, clock. And when the time runs out, you are to stop speaking. Um, I would also remind you, of course, that we have publications of the Nolan Principles on page 9. Let us move then to agenda item 1, which is apologies. I've received apologies from Councillor Polly Andrews, Elizabeth Foxton and Ivan Powell. Are there any other apologies? I don't think so. Yes? Davis. Councillor Davis. Very well. Members of Council, I have to inform you that since our last meeting, we lost Councillor Peter Jenman. Who, passed, who sadly passed away. He was the member for Golden Valley South, and shortly I will ask for the four group leaders uh, to begin a tribute to him. But first of all, can I ask you all please to stand for a moment's silence. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jinman, as I said, was a member of the Golden Valley South Ward and a very valued and respected member of this council. Uh, I will now call on the four group leaders to make tributes to him. And I will, he was a member of the independent group, so I will ask Councillor Harvey to speak first. Councillor Harvey. The microphone on. Real. Uh, I'm honoured on behalf of the independents for Herefordshire to lead the tributes to Councillor Peter Jinman, who meant so much to so many of us here at the council, in addition to the many ways in which he is loved and missed in his community of Golden Valley and beyond. <coughs> partly as a result of his selflessness <coughs> and sense of public duty, and partly due to the truth in Benjamin Franklin's old adage that if you want something done, ask a busy person. Peter, despite all of his other commitments, had already been on U.S. Harold Parish Council for some years before he stood and was elected for the county in a by-election in 2017. Peter joined the new cabinet in 2019 as a support member and advisor to the leader, and we soon learned to know, admire, respect, and to love him for his intellect, for his experience, for his scientific <coughs> and practical approach to issues, and above all, for his sense of fun, plus the bonus of enjoying the sporting of his many cravats. Over the last four years, as well as being a dedicated ward and parish councillor, Peter provided invaluable support to us as a cabinet and to the leader on all matters relating to government and to parliament, and his knowledge of disease management and transmission proved invaluable to the Cabinet and the Council, both throughout co the COVID pandemic and the repeated episodes of bird flu that the County has suffered from. His insight into disease migration and anticipation of events enabled the Council to act early during the pandemic in preparing for and providing support to communities, 
care homes and vulnerable groups at a challenging time for everyone. We have absolutely no doubt that lives in Herefordshire were saved due to Peter's expert advice. His renowned questioning skills proved invaluable not only in Cabinet, but also in his work on both the Council's Audit and Governance Committee, his Vice Chairmanship of its Adults and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee, and also when representing the Independents for Herefordshire at Cabinet. Always seeing the glass more than half full, Peter was quick to encourage and slow to criticise. His laugh was infectious, his mutton-chop whiskers inimitable, and his relentless optimism raised the mood of any room he entered. We are all the poorer for Peter's passing and send our condolences and best wishes to his family and to his many friends. Thank you. Councillor Lester? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, go ahead. No, I don't think the microphone's working. Right. No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, well, I, I can't really better that uh, tribute that Councillor Harvey's just made. Uh, and so um, I think uh, she's done very well in summing up um, Peter's qualities uh, and what we will truly miss. And our condolences go to his family and friends who must still be reeling from a great loss. I reflect on Peter's contribution to the council and it was obvious through all of the things that he achieved in his life that he was a man of great learning. And I used to love to see that demonstrated by the piles of paperwork that was would be on his desk to the point where we would get a bit alarmed about the fact that as if some of this paperwork was going to fall over, it would take him all out. But that, that just go to show, it goes to show just how much learning he, he, he was able to embrace throughout his entire career. And uh, one of the things that I greatly admired about Peter was that <coughs> when you were in a council chamber and we were debating things, he would, from my memory at least, he wouldn't speak at the beginning. He'd, he'd be waiting and waiting and listening and listening to what people were saying. So he would, he would normally comment towards the end of the debate. And the one thing I always looked forward to was the fact that he was, he was probably going to say something that somebody else hadn't thought of. And that was the power of, of, of Peter's contribution, that he would weigh up what people were saying, and then he would come along and say something, and then the whole room would go, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. You know, and that is such a valuable contribution that he made to the debate. And, of course, he, he supported his colleagues throughout. And then, finally, I would just reflect on the fact that um, most of you who knew him were able to attend his, uh, the service uh, for his funeral. And it was one of the most moving uh, funerals I've ever been to. And uh, it was a great celebration of his life, even though it was a sad day. And that just speaks volumes about the, the type of person we have lost. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lester. Um, we just have to wait for the um, technicians to pick up the, the feeds on these. I'll go to Councillor James next, then Councillor Shounds, and then Councillor Matthews. I'm back on. <coughs> yeah. Can I, can I say... Um, it was a very sad day when we heard that Peter had died. I mean, I, I knew Peter probably more in the past from, from his pers private life, well, business life, as it were, as, as a vet than from his um, years as, uh, in, on this particular council. The great thing about Peter was that if it didn't need to be said, he didn't say it. So often many of councillors have a lot to say and there's nothing to say when there's nothing to say. And sometimes not saying anything is far better than saying something. Now, that might sound very silly, but, you know, um, he was one of those people that didn't always speak on a particular issue because he felt there was nothing to be said. I wish we could all adopt that, that, uh, that way. Um, I was... <laughs> It was fascinating. I'm sure you all read the Times um, obituary. As a reader of time, the Times, I, I saw it that morning. And uh, it, it, we saw a new light on Peter. It was almost a... He, had a, he had certainly had a hinterland and had a life outside of um, council and his, his profession. And that, that, you know, 
is what some of us probably miss, the fact that uh, we need more experience of the life outside of politics and local government. So uh, he was, I think, one of those people who thought before he spoke. And what he said was always pertinent. And it was never <coughs> platitudinous or cliche ridden. And I think we shall miss him on this particular council for that reason. Thank you, Councillor James. Councillor Chowns. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, Peter, yeah, I was personally really sad um, at the passing of Peter, and I know that many colleagues in this room um, felt and feel exactly the same. I think he is very much missed. And it is because he was, you know, simply a very good man. He was somebody who served his community his whole life, served as a vet, served as a counsellor, served as a pub owner, served as... <laughs> you know, a person fix, sorting out potholes and managing the common and all of these things, you know. He was a proper public servant and and a really lovely man as well. And I think, um, you know, we saw that working with him. Liz has talked about um, the, 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 well, and Jonathan as well, the light relief that we got from watching his piles of papers toppling and his, uh, his, his trademark dress sense and sideburns and so forth. He was a real character, a real individual. Um, and, um, and he was also somebody for whom evidence was really, really important. And I think for me that is his absolute key characteristic. He was somebody who really, tr truly lived and breathed and worked evidence-based decision-making. And he was really thoughtful, towards people and thoughtful about evidence. And that was a really useful, as colleagues have paid tribute to already, and I think a model for, for all of us, really. Um, Jonathan's talked about his funeral, which was, I agree, an incredibly moving event. It was absolutely packed, overflowing, the churchyard overflowing, the, uh, the room to the next door overflowing, hundreds and hundreds of people there. And such a tribute to a man who'd had such an impact on so many people's lives. And um, I was looking again last night at um, the funeral, uh, the, the document, and remembering there was there was actually a poem that was read by one of um, the political one of one of, one of um, his his colleagues from the independent group, which was the poem that starts not how did he die, but how did he live? Not what did he gain, but what did he give? And I felt he was really, that poem for me just absolutely spoke to what he was about. And it, the last line of it is, how many were sorry when he passed away? And I think the, the measure of Peter's, um, the measure of Peter's worth and contribution is how many truly have been sorry at his passing, his early passing, and send our love and best wishes to his family and his loved ones and those who were closest to him. So I really hope that his example of public service and of evidence-based decision-making and of just being a really good person um, is something that will inspire um, all of us and, and lots more people to get involved in politics because politics does need more people like Peter. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Matthews. Thank, thank you, uh, <clears throat> Chairman. Um, I was the person that brought Peter into politics. I contacted him about five or six times before he would uh, entertain the idea, but I eventually convinced him that, you know, he had a duty to do. He was a parish councillor, he was well known, and he was respected, and although he was a busy man, he, uh, he joined up. Uh, Councillor Crockett and I spent very near three days doing most of his leafleting for him, and, and as I said, he, he got elected. But one thing that, that um, I did have a little bit of a laugh about, one afternoon I was up in a very isolated area at a farm, and I said to the farmer, I was canvassing for Peter Ginman for county council, and he said, I won't vote for him. I said, oh, why is that? He said, he killed my dog. <laughs> so, so, I, so when I got back and said to Peter, he said, I didn't kill his dog. He says, poor old dog with his last legs, and I just gave him an injection to help his grief, you see. 
But we had a good laugh about that, but that was the sort of chap he was. <clears throat> and as it goes to say, he was, uh, he got elected, and, and uh, uh, I worked uh, very closely with him. I was his group leader for eight years. Uh, he, uh, him and I were a very formidable opposition on council. He used to sit alongside me and we used to work with each other to uh, hold uh, Councillor Johnson and others to account and did a very uh, a thorough job. <clears throat> uh, um, he was not only uh, highly involved in uh, local council, but as we all know, he was highly involved in the veterinary profession and, local go and central government. He had a wide range of experience. <clears throat> Uh, he used to speak. To, we used to speak to each other almost daily, and and, and uh, uh, at all group meetings and that. Although he had to travel a long way, he he was always the first to attend. <clears throat> uh, he was a a, a a very sound and appreciated and respected counsellor and a very good friend of mine. And and as I said, like he stood uh, for me uh, after a bit of persuasion and. Uh, <clears throat> And I've, I used to speak to him about all sorts of issues, and as previously been said, he gave some very sound advice. Uh, I agree with my colleagues who have just spoken. He'll be greatly missed, not only locally in the uh, US island area, but by this council and government and elsewhere. And we need more of this caliber in local government, which will be a tremendous asset. So, so my condolences to his family, and I know them quite well. Uh, um, <coughs> And, and as I said, like, you know, you'll be a great loss and uh, we've got to find somebody appropriate to replace him. And I Thank hope it'll be a true independent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Matthews. Uh, just to conclude, um, members of council, I, I wrote on behalf of all of you to his family to express our sympathy and condolences at the time. Um, I, I know uh, just two gaps, really. Um, nationally, he did a tremendous amount of work working with government and it was interesting that on his death, the first time the Minister of Agriculture spoke at a public meeting, he actually paid tribute to him. So I think that shows something of the calibre of the man was recognised nationally. And from my own personal point of view, uh, neither of us could attend the February Council meeting because obviously we were battling the same problem. And uh, he and I nodded and had some brief exchanges and uh, uh, I will long remember uh, that exchange. Um, thank you all for that. Um, we move on then to agenda item two, which is the declarations of interest. Um, have we re are there any declarations of interest? As I've, as I've said to you before, if you think you have any declaration of interest, please contact the monitoring officer before. That would be very helpful. If during the course of the council meeting you think there is an in uh, interest, it's better to ask the question uh, rather than leave it out. Very well, let's move on to item three, which is the minutes of the last meeting. Uh, this was held on the 19th of May. Uh, there has been two um, um, uh, slight modifications that where it says chairman, it should say chairperson. Are you so in agreement that that should be amended at this stage and we can take that, that gender issue up with the group leaders if necessary? Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. We now move then to item four, which is for noting, which is the chairman and chief executive's announcements. Um, on my report, I bring to your attention the workings of the LGA and particularly for new members to be aware of that organisation and of the tremendous asset it can be for you to help understand more about local government, um, about serving your community and also um, delivering public services and particularly of the campaign that they are launching about debate not hate. I also bring to your attention hopefully you're all receiving the rural services networks, um, um, emails and updates. Um, there's a reference there to the armed, uh, the armed Forces Covenant. And I also bring to your attention the Chairman's Charities. Um, I'm working with uh, the Cabinet Member and the Director, and hopefully we'll work with all of you in helping to raise the profile for us to become a more uh, dementia-friendly community, because it is one of those issues that we are going to have to come to terms with. And following five suicides in this county in the agricultural community this year, um, I have made We Are Farming Minds also one of my charities. Um, mental health is an issue that we are all, of course, in uh, understanding to a better extent, and it is something, uh, as community leaders, we need to clearly understand as well. And also there are some references to some of the activities that I have been involved with. Chief Executive, do you have anything to add to your Thank you. 
Very well, then. We'll move on to agenda item five, which is questions from members of the public. The first question is from Mr. McGowan. And we have a supplementary. Hello. Yes. <coughs> the supplementary question from Mr. McGowan is, <coughs> would printed copies of draft master plan be available to parish councillors? For example, would the parish clerk be able to formally ask that Dillon Parish Council obtain 12 printed copies, 13 if the clerk can also have one. These would aid the councillors in depth discussion in advance of consultation. Also, and possibly more significant, these printed copies could be made available to Dillon residents so that they can become fully informed, say placed in the borrowed book corner in St Mary's Church, the Crown Community Hub, Village Hall, etc. This would help Dill winners to raise relevant concerns. Also, as a simple resident stroke householder, I have a minor vision impairment and find hard printed copy easier than on screen documents. Would I be able to formally ask to be provided with a printed copy from, say, Information Governance Team, Herefordshire Council, so that, like the councillors, it will enable me to have better accessibility <coughs> and fuller understanding. <coughs> I can then be better prepared when the draft master plan is put for consultation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Price, are you going to reply? Yes, I have a reply. Uh, thank you, Mr McGowan, for the... Um, or is it Mr McGowan? I'm not sure. But anyway, I'll go for Mr McGowan. Um, you are far from a simple resident, and we take notice of what you said. As part of any public consultation for the Hereford Master Plan, consideration will be made to differing needs of consultees across the county. We expect that accessing the consultation um, material will be primarily through the website or at public exhibitions, although hard copies will be available in libraries. However, where requests for printed copies and other formats are received from parish councils or individuals, we are happy to engage with them to understand how to best meet their needs. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Price. The next question is from Ms. Reid, and I understand there is a supplementary, and that uh, you're going to ask the question yourself. So if you'd like to come forward to the public um, area there, and uh, then you may ask your question. And I understand, as, as the uh, Cabinet member is away, uh, Councillor Lester will reply. Um, before I begin, just a couple of more points. Um, first of all, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. You, you, can, you can only ask a question. Yeah, yes. <coughs> um, all, all, I'm, all I'm saying is I would like the... Um, I would like to ask the leader my supplementary question as he responded to my original public question. Okay, so I'll begin the... Yep. Public questions have often not been fully answered, answered late or unanswered. For example, four public questions were submitted to the February Children's Scrutiny Committee meeting, but none were answered before the meeting. At the next Children's Scrutiny Committee meeting this month, six public questions were submitted. All six questioners are dissatisfied with the responses to their public questions and or supplementary questions, including the former chairperson and vice chairperson of the committee. The explanation for rejecting my public question was that it repeated the answered public question about co-optees. The response would have answered my public question for any other scrutiny committee. In future, will public questions and supplementary questions be satisfactorily answered and per the Constitution? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your question. You may retire. Uh, uh, Councillor Johnson. Uh, Councillor Lester. <laughs> now that takes me back that takes me back thank you Miss Reid for the question uh, um, uh, thank you very much for the question I think there was a technical difficulty with the February uh, issue of questions raising public questions and then getting uh, published answers and the ability to have the opportunity to raise 
supplementary questions is absolutely vital to the running of this council. And so we cannot have a situation where the, the system malfunctions. And so we will make every effort to ensure that that doesn't happen again. There is the situation where if a question's already been asked or it, it doesn't uh, fit in with the constitutional arrangements, it can be rejected. Um, so that's part of the process and it always will be. But I think it's really important that we strive as best as this council can to answer those questions in a way that is right in terms of what the council provides as services. Members of the public might not always agree with the answer, but it is imperative that we give an answer and it is imperative that members of the public continue to feel that this adds value to the running of the council. But thank you for your question. Thank you. We move on then to agenda item six, which is questions from members of the council. And we have a question from Councillor Oliver. <coughs> Do you have a supplementary? Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I, I welcome the, the announcement um, that 1,274 units will be built within four years. Um, can I ask, are, are these 1,274 houses all to be built by the council? How many will be built in Hereford City? As regards the 4,675 units with outline planning permission, uh, I assume that most of these are on the land banks of, of the housing companies like Bloor, Barrett and Taylor Wimpy. I know that Bloor have, one, have outline permission for 1,000 homes at Rotherwas. They've had this for about 12 years or more. They've not built a single home. Could the council persuade them uh, to part with a, a portion of the land to enable, enable social housing to be built where the jobs are on rather was? Um, I would remind, I would bring to the attention of the CEOs of these land banking companies uh, the words attributed to Jesus in the Gospel of St. Matthew. It is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. I would pass that, these remarks on to the CEOs of our, million, uh, our millionaire water companies. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Biggs. Are you on? Councillor? Yes. Yep, you are now. I am now. Yes, um, thank you for the question, uh, Councillor. Um, I think, as you can see from the written response and, and the, the, uh, the questions being asked, there's a, there's a detailed response required here that we will come back and write in. But I'd also like to offer to, to meet with the Councillor as well, personally, if you'd like to pick up any of those concerns um, as part of that follow up. Thank you. Um, We'll now move on to agenda item seven then, the leader's report. I'll remind members um, that these are questions uh, to the leader um, and the leader may um, uh, bring in um, cabinet members to answer the questions. Um, as per the email I sent out, I'll take these in batches of, th of, of three. Now, they will be um, on the, uh, the nine items uh, of which um, item one is split in two uh, in front of us. Um, I have checked, I was asked a question about portfolios. You'll have to take that one up privately with the, with the leader of the council. So that's, but thank, thank you for raising with me beforehand. Um, so uh, leader, you are going to introduce your report. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, Chairman and, and full council. This is the first opportunity for me to say a few words as the leader of the council. And, um, <laughs> It's been a busy time for me, but it, it's been a busy time for everyone, all, all councillors. And uh, it's been a busy time in that, um, you know, we've all had to have our training and embrace a wide range of uh, issues and increase our knowledge about a, a, a plethora of issues. And that is no easy task, even for returning councillors. And so uh, new members, you, you, you have my sympathies because you've had a, a steep learning curve and there's been a huge amount to, uh, to take on board and you will continue to do so, no doubt, because all of us on this council are determined to get the best results for Herefordshire. Um, and uh, I welcome working with everyone on this council to achieve that aim. 
Um, before we go on to the questions item, uh, I just wanted to, because I, I haven't been able to uh, speak at the last meeting, I just wanted to pay tribute to the former chairman of council, uh, Sebastian Bowen, for all of his hard work and efforts over the, f the four years. And I know he's here today. And so I just wanted to spe uh, pay a special tribute to him. Uh, and also, I wanted to say that I would like to thank Councillor Hitchener and the last administration for all of their hard work, dedication to duty, and, and how they fought with many challenges, COVID being one of the most significant. Um, running a council is a very challenging role. It's very rewarding, but it is also very challenging. And I know that the last administration, we, we, we might not necessarily agree with some of the direction that uh, they chose to go in, but you know there was no doubt for one second that they were fully committed to trying to do the best for Herefordshire, and I would like to thank them for that dedication and endurance because it's uh, it's not a sprint; it's uh, it's, a, it's a relay race uh, over many many hurdles as well. So uh, I'll stop the analogies there, but uh, thank you to them. Yeah, mixing my metaphors. Um, and also, just to thank officers of the council who, you know, obviously have have uh, have to run the business of council, no matter who is uh, running the executive. And so, thank you to them, who have been very welcoming to uh, the new administration and continue to de deliver. We've all got to work hard together, and I look forward to us all working with officers to achieve those aims. I've met with as many members of staff as I can. Because let's not forget for one second that they're the ones who deliver all of our services and uh, there's a real positivity with officers and we've got to really help and support them to achieve the best aims for Herefordshire and also just lastly you'll be happy to hear uh, um, I'd like to thank my my cabinet uh, who've hit the ground running I've still got a lot of work to do in terms of finding out uh, the direction on many issues and uh, they're really looking forward to taking on some of the really good ideas from the last administration. And as you know, we'll be keen to um, put their stamp on things as we move forward with other exciting developments as we go on in this council. So that's my introduction, and I'm happy to take any questions about the leader's report. Thank you. Uh, thank you, leader. Uh, right, um, I'm going to refer to page 27, and, uh, and we'll start with agenda item 1A there. Can I have indications of people who want to speak? As I said, I'll take them batches of three. Councillor Harvey, Councillor... <laughs> There's three there together in a line. Councillor Harvey, <laughs> Councillor Hitchener, um, um, and, and Councillor Crockett. Yeah. OK, so in that order, please. And then, Leader, if you re uh, reply. Th thank you, Chair. <coughs> um, <coughs> after the swinging cuts made to early help and preventative services, for families and children from 2014 onwards under previous Conservative administrations. Please could the leader give his, this council his assurance that he will at least maintain and perhaps even expand the funding now provided for these important front end services and make a commitment to follow the lead provided already by Hereford City and Ross Town Councils by reintroducing tangible county level support for the reinstatement of broader youth service provision, also for our teenagers, as his cabinet gears up to commence the budgeting process for 2024-25. Uh, thank you. Councillor Hitchener. Uh, thank you, Councillor uh, Lester, the leader, for uh, acknowledging our, our efforts. Um, that was uh, very kind of you. Um, the kindness might stop now, I don't know. Um, um, I, I was pleased to see that arrangements have been made with Leeds City Council Children's Services. Could the Cabinet member please say how this is to be funded? Given this is a form of partnership, are the responsibilities of both parties clearly understood and recorded in an appropriate document? And if so, can that document be shared? Will there be a reporting mechanism on progress which will include the Cabinet member? Thank you. And Councillor Crockett. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, for your information, I too have had to endure a summer cold. I am a woman, and I'm glad that we've both been able to make it here today. I, pre I, I, I know that what you, the, 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 the strength of character you have. <laughs> 
Um, on children's services, as a previous cabinet <coughs> member, yes, I know it was adults, and someone who looks <coughs> to this council to control their budgets and even save on them, the leader and cabinet will have been in possession of the detail of quarter one financial outturn for almost four weeks, although it has not been made it has not made its way into the public domain or been shared with scrutiny. In the absence of the figures themselves, please will the leader provide the council with his assurance that the improvement plan and the savings signed up to by the children's directorate are both on target to deliver with their respective budget envelopes. Thank you. Uh, uh, leader of the Council. Yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, Councillor Harvey, thank you for your question. Uh, yes, uh, uh, early help must remain and be, uh, well, the, the focus on early help must be increased because um, if we can have a situation where we are addressing uh, uh, the matter when families come into difficulty on the outset, then that's where the help is most effective in preventing longer term problems. And so it's absolutely right to make sure that there's resource nearer the front door than uh, w when it's much too late to uh, solve those little uh, issues or the, the, the problems that then develop into more serious problems. So it's absolutely right that the focus is on early help. And uh, the, the, the best way of dealing with a situation like that is to ensure that when you've got the resources in early help, it then takes the pressure off the, the services which have greater intervention. And so it's absolutely right that we focus on that. The early help strategy is embedded in our improvement plan, and that is really wanting to focus our multi-agency early help arrangements and that will include support for adolescents. The more we can invest at the front end, the, the less we have to invest in the crisis, and that is the best way for families, that's the best way for the council, and the best way for everyone uh, to put to, in, in the best way for everyone to proceed. Um, Councillor Hitchener, Councillor Hitchener, the, the, the support from Leeds, which we very much welcome, because we must remember Leeds went on their own journey and got to a stage where they're outstanding, and that is to be commended on all counts. Um, but the money uh, that, you know, for the, for the service they will provide, that money has come from the Department for Education, and that is uh, for two years, and uh, that money is very welcome. Uh, we, we used effectively, and we very much look forward to uh, making sure that there will be reporting mechanisms to show the effect of that. There will also be uh, lots of different opportunities for us to report back on how the progress is being made through the improvement board, through the safeguarding partnership, and also through regular updates from uh, two me members, and not forgetting, it, of course, the uh, continual relationship we will have with Ofsted to plot this improvement. And f finally, Councillor Crockett, thank you for the question. It's, it's all about making sure that uh, the council has funds to do its, uh, it, it, all of the functions and to keep an eye on the budget so that they don't overspend. Um, I just have to confess that your question is a little bit premature because I've got a meeting after uh, this meeting to talk about the quarter one performance uh, with Councillor Stoddart. Uh, and so please bear with me while I have that meeting and then I'll be able to give a much more uh, better uh, answer to that question. But of course, these uh, performance reports will be coming to Cabinet as well. And, I'll, and when they do, I will welcome your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, we're still on Agenda Item 1. Are there any more questions on Agenda Item 1? Uh, are, you, are you 1A or 1B? They merge. They merge. Any, any, any others? And, uh, and, and this is 1B as well, then. Any others in 1B? In which case... Uh, Councillor James. I'm there now. Uh, can I welcome what's in uh, 1B? Uh, it's a great <coughs> shame, and I think, I think the leader and uh, uh, certainly the Cabinet member would, would agree that it's a great shame we didn't adopt this approach many years ago, that it, um, it would have saved us an awful lot of trouble now. 
Um, and it's because of the lack of that sort of um, way of going forward that we find much of the problems we have, have had in the recent times that have come to, to the surface. Could, do, does he also recognise that whilst you know, it's laudable and we should have been done it a long time ago, uh, this sort of thing of, of uh, early intervention and early support, that there's going to be a lag between the benefits of that and the savings that will be made. And we're going to have a period when it's going to be rather expensive and we will have great financial difficulties in sustaining the current situation and the way in which we can improve that. Okay. Uh, leader? We have to make sure that we've got a service that is running effectively so that we can pay for the service we need rather than the service that we're paying for, which is one where we need to stabilize and create improvement. And, the, you know, we have to have that balance, don't we, bef between making sure that the resources are there, but also to make sure that we're forward planning and forward looking so that we'll be in a state where we've got a much better service that will be resourced in the way that it, it deserves to be resourced and, a, and in a way that is not having to be reacting to events. So that the, the whole goal is to get that improvement into everything we're doing with children's services. We're having a, a new approach, we're having a new refresh about the way we look at things, and that's gonna be key. But what, what is also going to be key is continuing to work with uh, the Ofsted, working with Leeds, which is a new exciting opportunity, and we've got that extra resource to help us guide us with that. But absolutely, we have to make sure that front door is as welcoming and as supportive and as helpful as possible so that we don't then do not go into a, a mode of operations that is more costly and uh, not as effective as it could be. Thank you. Um, I'm moving now to uh, river restoration. Any questions on river restoration? Uh, yes, I've got uh, Councillor Heathfield and then Counsel Councillor Bolter and then Councillor Hitchener. And, okay, those are, those are the first three. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, I'm so glad to see river restoration um, number two in the list of priorities. Um, and I'm very glad to see this national endeavour, um, DEFRA, cross-border task force and river champion. However, I'm concerned that that national level of action will not really address the issues to do with the river's lug and why. And I would really like to hear more about um, what's happening locally on the request for a water protection zone, the use of um, bylaw to protect our rivers, um, the Cabinet Commission on Phosphates, and indeed the Nutrient Management Board um, on what is being done urgently locally. And I'm very glad to see about that £2.1 million bid. And if it is successful, how will it be spent? Um, and the next, 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 next question... Councillor Bolter. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just going through what the previous councillor said, some of the things are very similar, but Independence for Herefordshire Council has welcomed the meeting that we had on the 30th of May with Theresa Coffey, which was arranged under our administration, if you remember, as part of the considerable work we undertook to take the whole catchment addressing the many issues impacting on the condition of the Y, in brackets, the nation's favourite river. The Minister talked about the need to be more radical, but then just restated activities which are already funded and underway. Did anything new and tangible actually result from that meeting with government, and if so, was it this not made public at the time? Thank you. And Councillor Hitchener. Thank you, Chair. Um, the uh, item eight on the agenda, which is notice of motion, uh, contains an update on previous notice of motion. Three updates. Uh, the WPZ Phosphate Commission and Riverwide Bylaws direct us to an update in the leader's report. Uh, there is none. Uh, can I give the leader the opportunity to update the council on those three items? And in particular on the Phosphate Commission, uh, this was a very effective way of bringing council politicians from both sides of the Welsh border together in a common cause. Uh, 
does the new administration plan to continue with the Commission and also continue with dialogue with Paris Council in particular on areas of common concern? Uh, leader. Uh, can I answer these questions in reverse order? Because um, the, the, the as, point long as, as long as you answer them. Uh, as, long, as long as I answer them. Councillor Hitchener, that's an excellent question. And, and I think the Cabinet Commission does play a very important role and needs to play, continue to play a very important role in um, making sure that the, the issue is, from a political point of view, is kept on the agenda and involving the right political uh, support to make sure that this issue is front and centre. And as you will know um, from my work with parish councils and being on a parish council and representing nine parish councils, as I always remember and remind people, working with parish councils is absolutely vital and we must continue to have that liaison with them because they play just as important role <coughs> as anyone uh, with regard to making sure that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a regional effort, it's a national effort, but a county-wide effort and a county-wide focus on that. Um, the bit about the progress, I will have to uh, defer to get you an answer to those updates about those three specific points, uh, so please bear me with that. Uh, uh, Councillor Bolter, yes, it was really important that the Secretary of State attended that roundtable meeting. Um, it was important that uh, Secretary of State was there because it needed government advice, it needs government help, and it needs to be pitched at that level to make sure that it is a, an, a national concern. And it was really um, gratifying and really important that the Welsh government representatives were there because this, you know, rivers don't respect borders. Um, they flow from one to the other, of course, and it's absolutely vital that we work with the Welsh government as well as. Uh, national government to ensure that this remains uh, 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 an, uh, an action for government. And we know, because um, our chair and the deputy leader have been to number 10 to talk about these issues, to raise the awareness with number 10 as well. So it has the attention at the highest levels. What the Secretary of State agreed to at the roundtable talks, which was the 30th of May, it feels like a lifetime ago now, but the 30th of May, um, what was agreed is that they were going to have a serious look <coughs> at all of the moving parts that are involved, because <coughs> there are lots of organizations involved, to come forward with a strategy, and we are waiting for that strategy. But meanwhile, we put forward our own ideas uh, and, and reiterated the points that we were making. And Councillor Heathfield, sorry, could you, could you just come back and r remind me of the most salient point of your question? I do apologise. Um, so it's about the, uh, really similar to Councillor Hitchener, that we've got those extant motions about the water protection zone, about the possibility that a bylaw could protect the river better. Um, we've got the Cabinet Commission on Phosphates, and indeed there's the work of the Nutrient Management Board, there's all this work and still I just, yeah, we're all really worried about the state of the river. So what is happening? Well, the, the first thing I did is, uh, as, as, as leader of the council, is appoint an expert, in my view, um, to lead the charge on this matter, which is Councillor Swinglehurst, our deputy leader. And because I made such a wise choice as to put her in that position, I'd quite like her to answer that question, please. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Lisa. Um, yeah, I'm happy to happy to do so. Um, the water protection zone request, which came both from full council and also from the nutrient management board to government, uh, has has been knocked back um, due to government's argument that regulations have to be given full opportunity and scope to uh, be proven to have failed before we introduce more regulations. Um, a, a WPZ is not an easy fix. It's a it's a really long drawn out process to even get a WPZ. So. Um, you know, it is what it is, and uh, you know, it's still it's still there, it's still on the table, and you know, we're we're working towards it. Um, Cabinet Commission, um, we haven't met uh, since I've taken over the portfolio, but I am in fairly constant contact with uh, Councillor uh, Charlton from Paris, um, and Councillor maybe from Monmouthshire, um, and Councillor Phelps from uh, Forest of Dean, um, on account of them being on the Nutrient Management Board. As well, the, the issue there is that the Nutrient Management Board um, is uh, reviewing governance arrangements for the 
because there's an enormous number of organisations here. You've got the Nutrient Management Board, you've also got the Wire Catchment Partnership and the Wire Catchment Partnership Steering Group. And at the moment, there's a conversation about how these organisations need to relate to each other and how the Nutrient Management Board needs to relate to the emerging new governance structures within Welsh Government for the Nutrient Management Boards in Wales. So all of this is kind of slightly going through the, the process at the moment, and the Cabinet Commission will need to fit into that in some way that makes sense. Um, now, I, I see the Cabinet Commission having a really important, very specific role as, as, as being a politically uh, a, a political organisation which can therefore uh, reach out politically, and, and that's a unique... Uh, thing that it that it can do. So I look forward to um, talking with the colleagues on the cabinet commission, seeing how they feel the future of that should look. Because I think we have to agree and 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 you know see where all the other moving parts sit, and then find the unique uh, sweet spot for that work. Um, yeah, say so nutrient management boards going through some governance uh, issues at the moment. There is a lot of work being done. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't all seem to pool in one place. And that's what I'm trying to get everyone to do. So could you please, you know, can we get it all in one place so we can see what's happening? Because there is a lot of stuff going on. Um, the rights to the river um, that, that I put forward as a notice of motion, um, I, I, I kind of, when I did it, I thought, hmm, don't really know. But it starts a conversation, doesn't it? So I, I, I've, I've discussed it with the county, with the council no. solicitor. Um, the bylaw, uh, because bylaws are designed to be simple things, you know, um, that, it, that it's not it's not a really good fit, but it starts the conversation. So we're now exploring the potential around um, a, a, com a commissioner um, and that the rights of the river would be embedded there. And then that's led on to a slightly bigger bit of thinking around rights of nature. So it's still, I'm still okay. sort of mining that out and uh, having conversations at multiple levels to see where that where that takes us. Um, thank, thank, thank you. So, I, um, thank you. Um, could I ask speakers to note my pen? <laughs> uh, but but thank you for that very comprehensive answer. I'm going to take I'm going to take uh, I'm going to take another batch of uh, there's another batch of three that I think uh, can no answered. Any other questions on this item? Okay, uh, Councillor Stark. Councillor Stark, on? Thank you're you. on. Um, I listen with interest to Councillor Swingle has said today. <coughs> Can I remind this council that in January 2022, you unanimously passed a motion that I proposed on a water protection zone. Now, I understand the concerns, leader, from government about the difficulty of imposing that, but can you press again on them, leader, that without concrete action on a voluntary uh, um, approach across all partners involved in this that we really would be pressing again for the implementation of a water protection zone. I hear about all these conversations that are going on but I still have no confidence that we are tackling the problems facing our rivers today. So I would like to have that reassurance from the leader that we will remind government that this council uh, has got a policy okay. on its books to implement a water protection zone if nothing else is forthcoming. Thank you very can much. You, can you give a quick reply to that? Yes, the the, the, the quick reply is, um, yes, as I said in my comments earlier, we've brought this issue to the Secretary of State and government. Lots of people are involved, but we need some real direct action. Uh, but what we need also with that direct action to make sure that we're really addressing this matter head on and with pace which was the, the main thrust of the roundtable talks in May. Um, the, the key thing is to work with partners and with all of those who are having phosphates that, to deal with, work with them to encourage them through best practice to really improve the situation. And the, the one key thing that gives me great hope is that there is technology out there that will really, once we enhance, well, once we grasp that technology and these methods of working, we can do a huge amount to ensure that best practice will be addressing this issue head on. Um, but that needs a concerted effort, which is why we are pushing for this, this, um, you know, this new arrangement. But we wait to hear from government with interest. Thank you. Thank you. I'm now moving on to item three, which is road improvements. Can I take any questions on road improvements? Councillor Bolter, Councillor Stark, and Councillor Matthews, in that order, and then I'll take another batch. 
Sorry, Chair, was it me first you say sorry? Yes, I think you did. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Um, I'm aware that we've got uh, a PGC on Monday regarding <coughs> the additional money that's come from the government, central government for potholes. But looking at the situation at the moment, the leader has said that we're going to put it through Balfour Beatty. Have we not looked at anybody to outsource? We've got 2.55 million, and at the moment, Balfour Beatty should be ready themselves with the plan to put the potholes right and fix what's there. Uh, should we be looking at additional equipment from outside partners with these JCB pothole fixes? It can be done in eight minutes, I'm led to believe. Um, these machines are best used on urban roads and pavements, enabling more to be done in a shorter space of time, leaving BPLP time to get on with their portfolio. So why are we not considering looking outside BPLP? And the meeting on Monday that we're having, I'm, well, I hope to be assured that uh, the Cabinet Member, Mr Durkin, Councillor Durkin, will be there and can listen to the views of members other than mine that I've just stated. Thank, thank you, Leader. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Stark and then Councillor Matthews. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Leader, I welcome your comment in your report that you're going to work with local <coughs> communities to ensure that new investment is <coughs> targeted appropriately. Can I remind you, Leader, that there's already an extraordinary market town maintenance fund operating at the moment that was agreed by the by council under the last administration, where the five market towns are currently allocated one million a year up to this year included. Can I ask the leader whether this administration will continue with that stream of funding, which has proved most useful for the market towns, and allowing them at least to allocate some funding for the priorities that they see on their highways and public realm. Thank you very much. Councillor Matthews. Yeah, leader, first of all, on a point of order, can you tell me why you declined my question on the children's services item? Uh, yes, because I had given notice that I was asking questions on 1B and Councillor James was the only one that had indicated at that stage that, that, that wanted to speak. So yeah, I then moved... I did, but late. But all right, as yeah. long as uh, uh, I, I don't want to lose democracy in this council and make sure members get an opportunity no, to ask and questions. and neither do I. Right, on road improvements, Leader, <clears throat> uh, um, I'd like to ask Councillor Durkin or Councillor Price or both... <coughs> Uh, um, the invest government investment has, has been referred to 2.58 million for road work. Warmly welcome that, and I warmly welcome the plans and programme to get some of the damage, <coughs> damage repaired on our road, which are in a highly dangerous uh, state. The main thing, could I ask them, that they make sure that we get a proper high standard of work from our partners and also value for money, because that clearly hasn't been the case in the past. Thank you. Uh, leader? Thank you. The, 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 the funding, uh, the 2.55 million of funding, we're really uh, appreciative of government uh, to government for giving us that money. There is an imperative that we spend that money as soon as possible so we can address the defects. Balfour BT are best placed to deliver that uh, that money, that uh, the, the work that needs to be done, because we need to spend that money within a certain time, have the information about where the defects are. So it makes perfect sense to ask them to go ahead with that to get that issue uh, sorted out as soon as possible. Um, all of the procurement is going to be tested by best value for money, and we will continue to do that. Um, Councillor Stark, yes, there's no plan to change the situation with market towns. Um, so just to reassure you there, uh, and uh, with regard to uh, value for, for money, I think I've just answered that question, um, Councillor Matthews, absolutely. We must strive very hard to make sure we get best value for money on everything we, we do. This money is uh, set aside to deal with a really important issue, which is road maintenance, and we must make sure that every penny is spent as wisely as possible. And also, for the long term, we must be looking at uh, investing in our road infrastructure, and I look forward to greater details coming out about how we can uh, address some of the uh, road maintenance in the spring next year. Thank and you. And also need a, a high standard of yeah. quality of work. Thank you. Are there any more questions on this item? Council oh, yes, sorry. Councillor Chowns and Councillor James, and then I will move on to the next item. Councillor Chowns. Thank you. Um, 
Thanks, Luda. Um, a couple of questions on the roads item. Um, while it's good news that we've got two and a half million pounds from government, um, I wonder if you'd agree with me that it's uh, that one of the <coughs> things that makes running a council challenging, as you were <laughs> referring to earlier, is the lack of a long-term multi-year <coughs> finance settlement from central government. And so the allocation of pots of money here and there to patch some potholes is no substitute for a long-term finance settlement for government and will he lobby government for that long-term finance settlement for fair funding for councils and for allocation of rose funding um, in relation to need um, and then the second question is um, could you clarify it I think this section you're just talking about spending the money that government has given us or are you saying that you want to spend more money on fixing potholes and if so where will you take it from and what will you cut? Councillor James. Thank you, Chairman. Just to say I welcome the £2.558 million pounds that has been allocated, but just to recognise that this is a drop in the ocean compared to what is actually needed. <coughs> I mean, government have taken away £60 million pounds a year to the, to the, the Council, and, it, you know, this is... A pittance compared compared to that, but what we've got to have, would you not agree, is value for money, and we have not been getting that from Belfer Beatty. I had a road uh, running alongside my my home, which um, Belfer Beatty came out three days running. Uh, three vehicles, five men. First day they filled in twelve potholes. The next day it was somewhat similar, and the third day it was somewhat <coughs> similar again. Now, that is not value for money. And, uh, you know, there are countless members of the public who could tell you that that's what's been going on, especially in the more rural areas where nobody's there to see what's going on. So please, please, do something about the way in which we, we deal with Balfour Beatty. Thank Hold them to, the, to account. No more. Thank you. Um, if you answer those two questions, and then moving on to the next item. Yes, thank you. Uh, Councillor Chance first. Uh, yeah, the, the government, uh, in terms of funding for roads, the government has been um, very helpful in providing government funding um, for the capital works. Since, since 2019, uh, they will have given this council uh, £63 million. What I'm really keen to ensure is that they continue to fund that transport grant, uh, road infrastructure grant, so that we can benefit um, from government funding to ensure that we do what we can to improve our uh, network, road network. As, as we're all aware, you know, there's 2,000 miles of road in Herefordshire, and that takes a, a quite a lot of maintenance, and uh, some of the roads aren't as... Uh, re aren't repaired as soon as they should be, but it's really encouraging to have that government funding, and I will continue to press for that government funding, as well as not to uh, not to decry the amount of funding that's reserved for uh, pothole money. It's actually road repair money, but it's called pothole money for for reasons that everybody can understand. But it's important to ensure that that money continues to come through from government as well. Uh, and I would ask all councillors to help me in our quest for ensuring that we get fair funding for roads because um, we have a, a low tax base, but we have lots of roads to repair. In terms of where's the money coming from and where will we have to cut, the monies that we're um, setting aside to do uh, much more extensive works next year will come from the capital program and it, it, it's monies that has already been set aside for road maintenance. So we look forward to making sure that that money is spent as effectively as possible. So we're, we're, we're spending money that's already allocated in the capital um, plan, so therefore we won't be cutting anything as a result of spending that money. The challenge for the administration and the challenge for the whole council is to ensure uh, and to echo the point or try and answer the point that Councillor James has made, is to make sure that that money is spent as effectively as possible. Thank you. I'll move on then now to uh, item four. We're halfway through our apparently allotted time. Uh, countrywide infrastructure. I'll take questions on that. I'll take Councillor, Matthew, uh, Councillor Matthews, Councillor Tillett, and then Councillor Fagan. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, could I ask Councillor Price or Councillor Durkin or whatever, 
I think it's Councillor Price with this one. <coughs> Upgrading the line between Hereford and Birmingham is an area <coughs> long overdue investment. We are working hard to ensure that our proposals for the transport hub, together with the plans, twin track and passing places in line. It's absolutely essential that we improve the train service between Hereford and Birmingham because of the uh, advantages rail transport will bring to the uh, local economy, etc. So could he tell, tell me if there's been any uh, uh, meetings with that network rail and, and what was the outcome? Because you'll remember back a few years ago, myself and my colleagues put a comprehensive forward <coughs> plan forward for this very program, and it was progressed <coughs> quite a way, and we were disappointed it didn't <coughs> want to pursue then. So if you could tell us what the latest position is, I'd be grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Tillett? Are you li you're live? I am now. Um, leader, you will be very aware that the two parties that campaigned in favour of the Southern Link Road and the Western Bypass made very substantial gains in May's elections and that there is now a clear majority in favour of that policy across this council. Um, his mention of this key policy is... Um, a little perfunctory, if you'll pardon the criticism, in his report. I wonder, could he share with us his um, aims and aspirations on the Western Bypass? Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor, uh, uh, Councillor Fagan? Yes, thank you. Um, d there's no mention in the report um, about the proposal uh, for which uh, Peter Ginman was a, a great supporter of the reopening of Pontrilus Rail Station. And my question is, uh, was this discussed with Midlands Connect? Uh, if, if it wasn't discussed, why wasn't it discussed? And is this administration going to put its back behind getting Pontrilus Station reopened? Thank you. Uh, leader? I'll take them in reverse order again, if you don't mind. Um, there was a very good, uh, thank you, Councillor Fagan. There's a very good reason why we, we didn't mention Pontrilus um, when we meted, when we met with uh, Midlands Connect, because Councillor Tillett, we were talking about the bypass. Um, so uh, yes, it, the Pontrilus idea, I think, is a very good idea. It must be explored. It would give a really good option for travel in that part of the county. And uh, it's my wish that uh, this administration has a serious look at the, the project moving forward. And, uh, you know, good ideas never go away. And so I think that, that this administration would be very keen to explore those ideas. Councillor Tillett, uh, it's a really good question, but you're absolutely right. You know, there, there's... Uh, the electorate uh, voted in lots of different ways, but um, two of the main um, votes went to parties that were strongly advocating a Western Bypass and the Southern Link Road, and that remains our focus, absolutely, as this administration. But the, the point of the report, really, and it's the point I would make about any infrastructure project, it has to be seen as a whole. And when the last... When I was involved in the last administration, the Western Bypass was part of a greater package um, that would be involved in ensuring that there's there's more cycling facilities, more bus facilities, uh, you know, making room for bus lanes and all of these activities in conjunction with a Western Bypass. So our focus has got to be on the whole picture, a comprehensive transport plan. But of course, that will include the Western Bypass, and it will include the Southern Link Road, because I think strategically, as you would agree with me, they make the best sense for creating a, tra a resilient transport network for Herefordshire. Um, but apologies if it wasn't as explicit enough for you in the report, and I shall take that on board next t time. And then the last question from Councillor Matthews, you specifically wanted Councillor Price to answer, so I will not rob you of that request. Councillor Price. Matthews for your question. Um, yeah, I can give you a bit of an update on this at the present moment. Um, just fairly recently, the um, Midlands Connect, with their support, they've um, announced a Midlands Rail Hub at Moore Street in Birmingham. And as part of that wider project, 
um, the the line which terminates from Birmingham at Hereford um, is now of more importance. And as part of that program, apart from many other things on the rail network that is wrong for our service into uh, Birmingham, they have promised to put into it um, the dual tracking from Ledbury to Shellac. Um, I have also spoken with the um, uh, West Midland Rail Executive about that this week, and um, I've put my concerns to them that um, to have a half-hour train from Birmingham to uh, Birmingham that travels at twice the speed of the current average, um, we must have that dual tracking, and it must not be lost because it's the end of the line and they run out of money. So I've tried to get that um, put in place to make sure that that is really upfront in their thinking. I've also spoken to Jesse Norman, the MP, this week about this project because he's been a big supporter of it. And I said, please make sure that in this, whatever funding they decide to cut on infrastructure um, in due course, um, the dual tracking of this project is not one of them. So we will get a better train service and Moore Street will, the hub is next door to Curzon Street, a short walk and Curzon Street is a connection for HS2. So we could get better services from Hereford when this project is delivered. Thank you, thank you. Uh, right, I'll take three more on this. I've got, I've got. Uh, there's nobody from this side, so I'm going to go down that side. I've got Councillor Harvey, uh, Councillor Crockett, and uh, sorry, Councillor Harvey. Was it Councillor Crockett as well? No, no, no Bartlett and uh, Councillor uh, 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 Councillor Heathfield, and, and, and then I'll move on to the next item. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Leader, on, on the 18th of May, National Highways announced that priority will be given to delivering existing road schemes and to tackling smaller road projects aimed at addressing local congestion, <coughs> like the Second City Bridge scheme, uh, with no new major road schemes being considered before at least 2030. Will the Leader confirm that his minority administration will continue the commitment to deliver resilience for the city with the already proposed smaller scheme to achieve a second city river crossing while pursuing national highways and government support for the grander ambitions for the bypass which sit at odds with national priorities. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Crockett? Uh, no, sorry. Council Councillor Phillips, if you want me to speak, I will. But, <laughs> no, no. Um, <laughs> Councillor Fagan actually answered my asked my question. All right, that's fine. <coughs> Councillor Bartlett. Thank you. Um, I welcome the news that we've been talking to Midlands Connect and we're talking about better services to reach Birmingham. Could uh, you give us your assurance that you will also be talking to Transport for Wales with the same type of enthusiasm to make sure that the links across the whole of the county where we've got them by rail do join up and right. are also very, very useful for the amount of people that need to get to Birmingham University Hospital that use the other line, the, the Welsh line through the county. Um, because at the moment, the times are not joining up very well between the um, Cardiff to Manchester line for people to change at Hereford to get to the University Hospital. So could you please also talk to Transport for Wales so we actually have a joined up system Thank across you. the county Thank you. on our railways? Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, Councillor Heathfield. Um, on a similar point, um, it's wonderful to have uh, rail infrastructure spoken about, and we also do need the trains. Uh, Great Western Railway has recently cut <coughs> its services, and people of Colwell and Ledbury, particularly in surrounding areas, really um, struggling, especially with the loss of the early morning service. Uh, so what can we be doing more about that, please? Thank you. Uh, Leader? Thank you. Uh, to, first to go to Councillor Harvey's uh, point about the announcement on the 18th of May. Yes, that, that was the announcement that was made and uh, it just re reinforces the fact that we really have to make a good case um, for why this matter needs uh, 
looking at once again. Uh, and I think there are compelling reasons why this matter should be looked at again, um, because it really fits with, I think, the overall direction. I was going to say direction of travel there. Apologies for that. Um, but, but the overall scheme for Herefordshire. And one of the issues that I think nationally we have to face, whether we're in Herefordshire or it's national government, is there is, a, there is an issue of connectivity with the A49. That is the major problem. And that is a national problem as well as an issue for Herefordshire and Hereford citizens in particular. So that national issue has to be raised at the highest levels because it needs a solution. Uh, the one thing I would say about the, the, the point about the Eastern Crossing, whilst I respect the, 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 what the last administration put forward and I understand the, the, the reasons for it, the decision to go ahead with that project is currently under review by uh, this administration. Um, Councillor Bartlett, um, absolutely, um, with regard to issues that affect not just England's con connectivity but Wales's connectivity, it's absolutely imperative that we all work together to ensure that there is that greater connectivity, whether it's by rail or road uh, or pathways even. Um, one of the things that I think is really encouraging is that uh, Councillor Price and I are working with the uh, in our place on the West Midlands <coughs> Rail Executive to raise quite a few issues. We met with them uh, just uh, last week, the latter end of last week, and we were talking to them about the fact that a there needs to be greater connectivity ac across the piste, and also there needs to be greater access for users of the railway facilities, which are not as good as they could be. Also, I'm really keen to explore, uh, with the help of the Chief Executive, uh, the, the need to, for councils to work with their cross-border partners in Powys and in Monmouthshire so we can raise the infrastructure issues that we have. So I think, yes, there's work to be done with the Welsh uh, rail networks, but there's also political um, partnership that must be uh, utilised to ensure that there's that connectivity across the way. That's in that's including roads, but it also, in, in particular, as you've highlighted, uh, includes rail as well. Um, and 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 so yes, Councillor Heathfield, we we really certainly n need to push for more greater connectivity. The, the network is already there, but it needs to work harder for our citizens. And let's not forget, not only our citizens that live here, but people who work here but don't necessarily live here, and also those people who love to visit Herefordshire. So that's what we why we've got to try as hard as possible. But. You know, we will do our bit, but I would really, really welcome the help and support from all members about this really critical issue, especially in, in regards to rail, uh, which I'm sure we're in all in agreement about. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious that we now have 15 minutes left, and you know where we are on the agenda. So could I ask members and the replies to be as succinct as possible, sorry, please? Sorry. Um, item five is the local plan. Uh, Councillor Stark, Councillor... Um, uh, Got my memories, <laughs> Councillor Harvey. How, how, you can tell how you can tell how ill I am today. We can't even remember Councillor Harvey's name. Uh, was, and was there anybody else? Nobody else. Those two, and then the lead, and then the leader, uh, Councillor Stark, and then Councillor Harvey. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, leader, I'm speaking as Chair of the Environment and Sustainability Scrutiny Committee. Um, I note you've paused the local plan while you look at additional pieces of evidence on it. Can I remind you that I presented a report on the local <coughs> plan with 13 findings in January this year to Cabinet. We have yet to receive a response, and I do hope you can give me reassurance today, Leader, that that report will be considered as part of the evidence base when you are reviewing the local plan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Chair. Um, Given the misery caused to so many of our communities since 2015 by unplanned development resulting from past Conservative administrations committing to delivering ha more housing in Herefordshire than even their own government said was feasible, will the leader give his assurance to this council that his minority administration will not be seeking to increase housing numbers above the reduced and focused numbers 
already consulted upon and proposed in the draft to the local plan update, which his administration has inherited. Thank you. Leader? Councillor Stark, I'm really sorry that your scrutiny meeting has not received responses. Uh, they deserve those responses, and you will be getting those responses. And uh, if, uh, I'm sorry, I haven't read those responses, but any of those responses, if they're pertinent to the local plan, which I'm sure they will be, they will be fed in uh, to the process. But uh, apologies for that <laughs> oversight, um, but thank you for bringing it to our attention. Um, <coughs> Councillor Harvey, sorry, I forgot something about a minority administration. I wasn't quite clear on that. Um, no, uh, um, th thank you for reminding me. Um, so, so, sorry. Uh, I, th I think, um, you know, with the best will in the world, you know, no plan is perfect. And a plan that comes forward uh, has its benefits. And it, for some communities, it may transpire that it has its disbenefits. So that just puts pressure on making sure that this local plan has the right approach and the balanced approach to housing. Uh, as you will appreciate and respect, we're in a process of reviewing the situation because we will be reintroducing uh, the idea of infrastructure like the bypass and the Southern Link Road, which will affect the, the overall picture of the emerging plan, but it is up for review. We're looking, you know, we're assessing the evidence that we've got, but, you know, with your knowledge and with other members' knowledge and then other members' views on the whole matter, it's absolutely essential that we hear that and feed that in to the, the, the local plan process. And I, I, I know you will make a, a, a sincere effort to ensure that you feed in those views uh, and we welcome them and we will uh, you know, look forward to integrating all of these views as we push forward with the local plan, which is of... Uh, uh, supreme importance when it comes to developing this county. Thank you. Thank you. Um, agenda item six is the health and wellbeing strategy, which was launched on in ju on uh, July the 11th. Are there any questions on that? Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, Councillor Stoddard. Yeah. Is that all? Yep. Just that one. Good morning. Uh, Leader, uh, like yourself, I attended the, the Health and Women's Strategy launch uh, earlier this month, uh, which I found both informative and inspiring. Uh, could he answer my question of how does he intend to take this uh, matter forward? By handing it over to Councillor Gandhi. Um, <laughs> no, can I, can I just say it was a real pleasure to be able to launch that event, but it was on behalf of Councillor Gandhi, because unfortunately she was ill that day and couldn't afford, uh, couldn't, couldn't attend. Um, but I, you know, Councillor Gandhi can speak for herself. But she is absolutely committed to ensuring that this strategy is, uh, you know, is put forward uh, and implemented and delivered. Uh, just want to make a special point, though, and I know Councillor Gandhi would want me to make this point: is that uh, tribute to Councillor Crockett for all of her hard work with this strategy. Um, Councillor Gandhi has inherited it, and it's a really good strategy. Uh, from inherited it from a council point of view, uh, and uh, she she really appreciates, and I appreciate the work that uh, Councillor Crockett and others and others. Uh, I'm sure I know Councillor Crockett would want me to thank others have put in making forward this strategy goes forward. But it's the same principle as all of these strategies. It needs to be delivered not by just Herefordshire Council. It has to be in collaboration with all our partners, everyone pulling their weight to ensure that we tackle the priorities, and in particular, the priorities of mental health and giving children the best start in life, uh, which are challenges in, their, in, in themselves, but uh, we are committed to making sure all of our partners and, and us, and us okay. step okay. up. Yep, I'm, I'm conscious, very conscious of time. Is there any other question? Councillor Stone, and this will be the last question on this item, and then I'll move on to seven. Uh, thank you, Leader. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Just like to ask the Leader um, on local health and well-being, I feel it's being assisted by the benefits-related free school meals being continued during the summer holidays as was started by the previous administration, quite rightly, um, during the COVID pandemic. Um, I very much welcome the fact that this is continuing. It's a great help to many low-income families, uh, particularly in my ward, 
Um, and I'd like to ask you, Leader, do you see any scope for the scheme being extended to include more children? Because there are many just on the borderline at the moment in the current cost of living situation. Thank you. Thank you. If you answer that quickly and then we'll move on. Um, yes, we will look into that and yes, we will make sure that where we can, we can extend the, the project. But I think the, the point is schools provide such a valuable uh, space for children uh, to, to learn and to grow and to be looked after. And, you know, providing those free school meals then is, is really beneficial. But it, it's also important to keep that going when there's yeah. out of school uh, and we want to keep to that commitment. Thank okay. you. Uh, item seven, are there any questions on the Care Quality Commission's the readiness report for the inspection? If there are none, let me move to item eight, which is the relocating of the Hereford Library and Learning Resource Centre. I have got Councillor Crockett, Councillor Swindlehurst, and Councillor Jennard. Uh, Councillor Crockett, you're, you're on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, Independence for Hereford, this little number of uh, councillors here, welcome the administration's decision not to scrap the plans for Maylord Orchard to be used as the location for the Library and Learning Resource Centre. But before we were yes, in this position, we did consider Shire Hall. We need to make sure that it is affordable, sustainable, deliverable, and socially a progressive location for this important <coughs> cultural project. Will the leader take the opportunity to confirm that the Maylords and the Shire Hall business cases will be considered together on a like-for-like -like basis when the Shire Hall case is eventually made available? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Swindlehurst. Uh, thank you. Um, so it always seems strange to me that one of the defining features of our county is without a museum or an exhibition space of its own, um, I speak of the River Wye, uh, would the leader undertake to explore the potential to establish a dedicated museum and exhibition space as part of this project to celebrate our river, to be a place to learn about its history, its importance to the economy of the county and the wonders and complexity of its ecology? Thank you. And Councillor Jennard. Um, I would also like to say I'm really pleased with the decision to pause rather than cancel the Maylord Orchards project. Um, could I be assured that a full stakeholder review and public consultation will be conducted with regards to potentially relocating the library into the Shire Hall? Thank you. Leader? Uh, thank you. Councillor Crockett, uh, I think you're independence for Hereford Shire, not uh, Hereford. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she, she's not well. I understand the problems. I understand her problems. <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to rob you of your, uh, your, your political authority, so um, yeah, there you go. And I must say, it's, 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 um, it, it's, it's interesting to know how um, people miss the Shire off uh, a lot of the time. Not Sorry, Councillor Crockett, but uh, I, one of my drives is to make sure that we always remember that it's the whole Shire that we're talking about. Yeah. Um, right, okay, so apologies for that. Um, yes, in, in terms of the uh, debate on the library, the, with regard to the business case, the recommendation <coughs> that was agreed uh, at Cabinet was a full business case for the Shire Hall development will be progressed to include the library works and the enabling works and reported back to Cabinet in October 2023, where these will be considered against existing plans for Maylord Orchards. Uh, uh, Councillor Swinglehurst, with regard to the River Why, my answer is why not? Um, Absolutely, the, 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 you know, whoever, whatever you, anyone's views about the location of the Library Resource and Learning Center, the, the virtue of having it at the Shire Hall is it gives lots of scope because there's lots of space in that civic building to do all kinds of um, functions and displays uh, and activities that can really reflect the cultural diversity and richness of our county and the environmental richness of our county. And I see no reason why we cannot include such uh, an initiative in that proposal. And lastly, Councillor Gennard, it's absolutely vital that we consult with library users and the communities um, that will be wanting to use the library services in, in many different ways. And so that community consultation must take place in various forms. What I would just add is that I would welcome and encourage all members to visit the Shire Hall 
and I can confirm that um, some of the works to make portions of the library, uh, sorry, sorry, Freudian slip there, um, to, to, to make the Shire Hall uh, safe uh, uh, will have been completed and so that uh, members will be able to tour the building. Um, you can't just walk up and use your key fob, so I would, uh, I would ask that you make arrangements with officers and the custodians, but you will shortly be able to visit the Shire Hall. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, I've got... Um, a, a final round of questions. I've got Councillor Highfield, Councillor Kenyon. Is there anybody else? These will be the last questions of this agenda item. Okay, just those two. Right, Councillor Highfield and then Councillor Kenyon. Uh, thank you. My question has actually been answered by the leader when he answered okay. Councillor Swigglehurst. Okay, yeah. Councillor Kenyon. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, let's get this right. As the independent for independence in Hereford and for Herefordshire, um, I'd just like to say thank you for the review on the library because I wasn't asked or first time round by the last administration, it was just thrust upon us. So I very much welcome this review. Let's see which one's best, let's keep them both in the pot and let's make a good sound decision by the whole of the council. Thank you. Thank you. Leader, did you want to respond or just confirm? Um, well, uh, th that's noted, Councillor Kenyon. Thank Agreed. you very much. Thank you. Um, colleagues, that completes um, uh, the hour's duration. It only left um, my Herefordshire's children's arts competition. Uh, you will uh, hopefully have noticed that some of those examples are on display throughout Plough Lane, so please notice them uh, and, and uh, accordingly. Um, that I had discussed with the group leaders about the way that we deal with that. I apologise that we did miss some but hopefully we, we got through in the hour, I think, as, as best we could. But it, it, it is something we will keep, keep monitoring. You need a flag rather than a pen. Yes, and people need to... I, I need a flag rather than a pen, and people need to look at my pen. But there we are. Um, um, can, can, I ask, can I ask that the... We are now going to uh, have a 10-minute break, um, and can I ask for the live stream broadcasting to cease for the moment? Thank you. Well, Colleagues, we'll break for 10...
Thank you. I think we are uh, back. Um, before we begin the debate, um, I would ask members to be succinct and to the point. Uh, the two um, uh, uh, motions are on page 44, um, so for, for, for your ease. Um, I, ha I will call on the, uh, the, the mover of the motion to, to, uh, to lead the motion. And then the seconder will have the opportunity to speak either immediately or later on in the debate. That will be their choice. Um, as of 9.30 this morning, which is the uh, appropriate time, no amendments have been submitted. Uh, shall we move then to motion number one? That is the county athletics track. It is as outlined as motion one uh, on page 44. And I call on Councillor Kenyon to propose the motion. Councillor Kenyon. Thank you, uh, Chairperson. The county, the county athletics track, it's the only county athletics track that's approved by um, British Athletics Association. And the background to it is, it won't pass its annual inspection. So the MOT, due in February, it will not pass. And if, it's not, if this track is not fixed, we will have no facility. We're the only county in the whole of England that won't have a... Um, athletics track. So that's the background to it. Now, the good news. Um, way back when, when they first started the appeal, there was a lot of money they needed to find. But there is a group of athletes and other people outside of those that decided we need to raise this money. And I've been so impressed by what they've done in the community. They've raised tens of thousands of pounds. Um, the city council stepped up to the mark. I'm very proud to be a member, as other uh, councillors are in this room and um, promised £70,000 if they, if they hit the target. So the City Council have stepped up, put the money where the mouth is with 70000 <coughs> Having done a promotional video, I'm sorry for appearing on it, amongst all those athletes, I did look like the shop putter. Um, In your <laughs> 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 can, can, that, um, can them moments be taken from my time allotment? Um, it also impressed, you know, government, HIT government and the level Leveling Up Fund, um, which they've chipped in as well. So the government Leveling Up Fund saw the benefit of this track, which is fantastic. So far, they've raised £380,000, which is amazing in the space of around seven, seven months. They're £70,000 short, and today is about asking for that £70,000. Um, I'm just looking at this. Um, I'm hoping, I'm pushing an open door, and other colleagues here today will add, add to what I'm going to say, but we spend, our budget is £193 million a year. What this is asking for is the cabinet, member, cabinet to look at, at it again and spend 70000 We spend £193 million on things we have to do. This is kind of a £70,000 where on things perhaps we'd all like to do. So if you can see that today... Um, at the end of this, if it, once they get there, they will get there. If we don't get this today, they will get there because they're a determined lot. Just look out for the javelin throwers leaving the building. <laughs> um, Halo Racecourse will become a centre of excellence, not just for Herefordshire, but for the region. Um, along with the cycle track, which is being delivered in September on time and in budget, which is a uh, credit to Halo, and the, the outstanding skate park. So let's make something really special. And this is a county-wide facility. It's not about Hereford, it's about the county. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Kenyon. Um, Councillor uh, Robert Williams, do you want a second now? Uh, at the end. Okay. Uh, very well. Uh, I remind members that you have up to three minutes to speak. Uh, can I have indications of anybody who wants to speak? I've got Councillor Gandhi and Councillor Harvey and Councillor James. Okay, we'll start with those three, and then I'll come back for the, for the other three. Yes, yeah, Councillor Gandhi. Um, I support this motion. Um, it is imperative that every county have an excellent athletics track. The last major investment in the track was back in 2006. Due to the nature of some of the disciplines that are in the sport of athletics, the track along with the field is the only place you can jump, throw and hurdle in a safe environment. Taking part in athletics is not just about keeping physically fit or winning a race or throwing the furthest. 
It's about helping many people's mental health and well-being. During the pandemic, many people took up running in Herefordshire, and this has shown a great increase in athletes joining local clubs. And the track currently hosts a number of meets throughout the summer months. Since the 80s, a number of talented athletes who came through the junior ranks have gone on to represent England, Wales and Great Britain at the Commonwealth, World Championships and the Olympics. In the county, we currently have over 700 registered athletes, along with coaches and officials. Just a few weeks ago, Dan Pembroke, an F13 para-athlete with a visual impairment, set a javelin European record and won the gold medal at the Para-Athletics World Championships in Paris to add to his gold in the Tokyo Paralympics. He trains at the Hereford Track and is amongst a significant number of well-known athletes supporting this project. We as a council recently launched our health and wellbeing strategy and one of our two core priorities is good mental health and wellbeing. What better way to demonstrate we do what we say is than to support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gandhi. Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I'd like to um, commend Councillor Kenyon for um, his uh, consistent support for this as a project and for his advocacy of the, uh, the work that the um, Athletics Club have done in raising all the funds uh, that they have, and also the City Council for um, supporting them to the tune of £70,000. Um, I'm very supportive of um, uh, of the principle of this, um, but if uh, if this council is minded to um, uh, get behind this motion, um, I would um, caution the administration um, on two regards. Um, first of all, um, and I stand to be corrected on this, but my understanding is that this is uh, the track itself is a halo facility that the um, that the athletics club um, has uh, has use of. Um, we have a long-standing arrangement with Halo in terms of them providing leisure facilities um, and uh, on property that we own. Um, and we do not, as I understand it, have a service level agreement with them. Um, I think that is a, um, an omission which is long overdue in its plugging. Um, I'm certainly aware of the degradation of playing service Playing surfaces, playing surfaces in uh, uh, at Ledbury facilities, where you know uh, all weather surfaces for hockey and uh, um, and, and uh, other other sports are difficult to play on because uh, they haven't been maintained in a good condition. And I think there is an issue uh, in terms of the, um, the, the level of maintenance that is undertaken by Halo of the facilities that they, uh, that they have use of on what I understand to be a full maintenance basis. So um, if we're going to be paying money to, towards getting the track in a fit state for um, our young and older athletes, um, and members of the public to uh, benefit from. Um, let's think about the consequences of that in terms of the precedent that it sets. Um, and not only that, um, we're being asked here for 15% <coughs> of the overall cost of doing that. Does that also <coughs> set a precedent where other organisations, other initiatives um, can and will look to the council um, for this sort of percentage contribution to the kind of projects that they might want to undertake elsewhere in the county. Um, I just raise those as points of caution for consideration. We need to be fair. This is public money. Thank you, Councillor Harvey. Who's next? I can't remember why. Did I say anybody next? I'd yeah, right, I've got Councillor Chowns, Councillor James and Councillor Jennard. 
Thank you. And um, Councillor Matthews afterwards. Uh, yep. Great, thanks. Um, I mean, I absolutely echo what colleagues across the, the room have said about the importance of participation in sport, how fantastic that is for, um, for well-being, and absolutely recognise this as okay. a facility that serves the whole county, um, and want to pay tribute to the amazing fundraising efforts by supporters of um, this track. But I, I also um, have, have some questions, really, I suppose. I do feel that decisions on what we fund as a council should be based on evidence, so a weighing up of benefits against costs and spending on one thing versus potential spending on another thing. Um, Councillor Kenyon has said this is 70 million in the con 70 thousand in the context of 193 million, but the truth is we don't have 70 thousand pounds hidden away down the back of the sofa ready to pay for something. So it, it would be money that had to be taken from somewhere else. And I'm not clear where the proposal is that the money would come from. Reserves, the pothole fixing fund, holiday schemes, the expansion of free school meals that Councillor Stone was talking about. There are always, there are many demands on, on funding. And uh, I, I, I echo the, the issue that Councillor Harvey raised about my understanding from the previous um, discussion on this in February is that the funding is needed because of a lack of investment in long-term maintenance. And so is there an issue here about the council stepping in to fund something that an organisation with responsibility should be taking responsibility for long-term? But fundamentally, I know that there are many, many amazing organisations in this county, sports clubs of all sorts and other types of facilities serving the community that would absolutely love to have 70 grand from the council. They'd absolutely love to have that money. And I think that if we're going to be giving grants away to organisations, then we really need to think about what's a fair process for applying for that so that we are giving the same opportunity to all such organisations and, and good causes. So I think decisions on grants to local organisations should be made in a fair way that enables all organisations to apply for funding if there is funding available and enables the relative merits of different proposals to be weighed up. Thank you, Councillor Cowns. Councillor James. Thank you, Chairman. I, I just think this is the bleeding obvious, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, quite honestly, uh, the nitpicking over this. The, there's, it's not setting a precedent. It's not setting a precedent. This is one of the, well, I think the only sort of national recognised uh, sporting venues for, for record making, etc., uh, that we have in the county. It's unique. It's £70,000. We spent that many times over over the last few years on furniture in in this building. Yeah, I didn't hear about anything about that when it when it was. I suddenly found that we'd spent hundreds of thousands of pounds on new office equ equipment and and uh, furnishings within the, the, this building. Where was the priorities as far as that was concerned? I only today heard of one of the most prominent um, uh, sportsmen of national. A national sportsman who lives in the county said, well, if this doesn't go ahead, I've got to move out of the county because I can't actually continue my, my, my career based in Herefordshire. And that's what will happen. We had a, a, an item on the agenda earlier on about, about um, health and well-being. What are we talking about? You know, this is a prime example of what we should be doing and supporting, we won't set a precedent because I don't know any other any other venue or, or sports club that has this particular importance as far as the particular sport in which they uh, they operate. So all I can say is, for goodness' sake, let's get on and vote in favour of it and stop faffing around, posturing. Thank you, uh, Councillor Matthews. Yeah, I fully support the comments of Councillor James, uh, um, and I understand what Councillor Chowns is saying, but as we say, we've a lot of what we spent could be questionable getting value for money, but this would be value for money. We've got a lot of talented youngsters in this county, and it would be a shame if this facility is lost and they didn't have an opportunity to go on and improve themselves and go to higher levels. So myself and my colleagues uh, have no hesitation in supporting this motion, and thank you to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I've got Councillor Biggs, and I've got nobody else indicating to speak. Uh, Councillor Tillett. Councillor Biggs thank, and then Councillor Tillett. First of all, I'd like to echo the, um, the uh, thoughts around Councillor Kenyon and his, his energy with this and his, his thrust to, to keep pushing this forward and, and help those that have, um, that have done so much to drive it forward. Um, look, I, not many would know, but before 
the elections most of my time away from my office. I was drawn away from the office because I coach and, and work with young people in sport. Um, and that's been somewhat replaced by, by time in Plough Lane. Um, but uh, as, a, as a parent of an international young athlete myself in a, in a different sport than athletics track, um, I think I've seen for myself the benefits that sport brings to the, to the health and the mental health of young people, um, the aspiration to drive forward and, and take themselves to other places, experience other cultures, travel, have friends across, across the, uh, the country and across the world. It's absolutely vital that we, that we support initiatives of that sort. And the thought that we wouldn't have an athletics track suitable for competition, for, for driving those aspirations for our young people and older people going forward is unthinkable. I think we obviously need to support this motion. Thank you. Councillor Dutellet. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> not for the first time, I'm a little bit disappointed by the comments of Councillor Harvey and Councillor Chowns. Um, many new councillors will be unaware of the d debate that we had on this issue back in February uh, when um, an additional pot of funding became available to the council and uh, Councillor Kenyon uh, put forward uh, an, in, an intriguing motion that included this uh, £70,000 as a way of um, adding to the funding for the track. And at that time, the administration, key members, Councillor Harvey and Councillor Chowns, um, said that this really wasn't the right way to spend this money, but that they were sure that £70,000 could be found in, a, in another way within the funding uh, uh, and within the budget to uh, pump, pump prime the athletics track. So back in February, the previous administration said, yes, we, 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 we can sure through another way that we will be able to find £70,000 to, to honour this motion. And now we move on a few months and suddenly all these caveats and concerns that were never mentioned back in February uh, are now becoming uh, major issues that we should consider. Um, Councillor James is quite right. Uh, I'm not sure why we're spending any more time discussing this. This is a key and absolutely critical county facility uh, and uh, I shall be very happy to support it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I have no, fur uh, no further indications, so I'm going to move to Councillor Williams to, second, to formally second the motion. Uh, it gives me pleasure to second Councillor Kenyon's motion. Simply, we need to renew the asset for the county. Without it, I believe we'd be far worse off as it's the only track in the county. Let's not forget all the user groups and residents, including out of county people, the use the facility. That's why we need to keep it, simply. In terms of the amount of money requested today, it is so comparatively minor for the return of investment to the county residents, young and old. It's the final instalment of what's been already a lot of fundraising efforts. That's it. So please vote in favour. Thank you. Um, if there's no other indications, I can we go back to the proposal of the motion. Councillor Kenning, did you want to sum up? This occasion, I'm going to be more Peter and less Jim. <laughs> <laughs> so people may want to mark this day down. <laughs> Very well. We will now move to the motion. Um, I'm going to do it by a, a raise of hands, if that is, 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 is uh, uh, right with everybody. Uh, um, Mr Evans will act as my teller. Uh, all those in favour, please show. A majority, that's a majority. And, and, any uh, against? None against. Any abstentions? There are two. Two recorded, otherwise everyone is four. Three. Th three, sorry, three. Three, okay. Three abstentions, otherwise everyone was in favour. That motion, therefore, is carried. We move on then to the motion number two, which is regarding climate and ecological emergency. Again, that is laid out uh, uh, on page 44 um, for your uh, benefit. I'll call upon Councillor Chans. Thanks, colleagues. Um, and you'll have observed, perhaps, that although I raised questions, I think valid questions on the previous motion, I did, in fact, vote to support it. And I hope that that spirit might, in fact, in, you know, inform our debate and voting on the motion that I've proposed today. <laughs> <laughs> because I think that... Um, 
I, I'm bringing this motion because, and in fact, you know, evidence-based decision making, which inspired my previous questions, has actually been a bit of a theme, I think, in in our discussions um, today in this meeting, inspired by the example of um, the late Peter Jimman. And the need for evidence-based decision making is really crucial in addressing the real and pressing climate and ecological emergency. Uh, just this last week, we've all seen the devastating wildfires in Greece and elsewhere. We've seen the effects of uh, the climate crisis here at home in Herefordshire very clearly, with the devastating floods of uh, 2020, for example, and um, uh, record drought conditions in summer also contributing to the declining state of our rivers. Uh, it seems that every week climate change breaks new records. Uh, July is on track to be the hottest ever month on record, and... Um, Yesterday, the head of the World Meteorolo Meteorological Organization warned that climate action is not a luxury, but a must. And in fact, uh, the head of the UN, the General, General Secretary, Antonio Guterres, said, we are no longer in the era of global warming, but global boiling. I think, you know, it really brings it home to us just how serious this uh, challenge is. And we know that this isn't just an environmental issue. This is a people issue. The heat waves in Europe last year uh, contributed to the early deaths of 60,000 people. That's extraordinary, in Europe alone. So the need for urgent action on tackling the climate and ecological crisis, I think, um, shouldn't be a political football. It's just common sense and the foundation for all of our decision-making. And so with this motion, I'm inviting every member of this council to renew our commitment to climate action and nature protection. Um, just to clarify, I've been asked questions about a couple of aspects, uh, so I thought it might be useful to clarify them now before the debate. I've been asked, you know, does, does the commitment to sort of zero carbon and nature rich, is the phrase we've been using in Herefordshire, does that mean we can't ever do anything? No, absolutely not. So, for example, net zero carbon housing means that you make it as energy efficient as possible and then you offset any residual carbon, for example, by investing in insulating existing houses to bring down emissions. So it's a win-win for everybody. And these things are good for reducing emissions. They make homes warmer and cheaper to heat for people in them. And they're great for business as well. These are really good um, uh, actions for creating high-quality jobs. Um, I've also been asked about uh, wording I put in there about accelerating progress. I absolutely don't mean, you know, an earlier date than 2030. 2030 is the date that we've already agreed as a council that we've been working towards. I simply mean that we need to renew our commitment and our energies to that. And indeed, um, the recent report by the Inter Inter in by the Independent Committee on Climate Change in the UK really emphasised this, that we need much more urgent action in the UK. We are off track with our legally binding commitments. We need to renew the focus um, on action. In earlier discussions in relation to um, issues around children's services, um, Councillor Lester, you said, the more we can invest at the front end, the less we have to invest in dealing with crisis. And that's clearly the best way for the council to proceed. And I absolutely agree with you regarding investment in children's services, and it's exactly the same in terms of investing in tackling the climate crisis and ecological crisis. We need to ensure that we're planning for the future. And um, Councillor James, in fact, you talked about the importance of you know, wishing that we'd adopted good forward-thinking process years ago. And again, it's the same with this issue. Um, by investing now, action is cheaper than waiting until things get worse down the line. So for those of us that were serving as councillors in March 2019, when uh, our original uh, declaration of climate emergency was, was taken, this is simply a restatement of what we voted for unanimously at that point. But of course, we've got many new colleagues in the room now. So this is an opportunity for all of us um, to uh, make that commitment, for those of us who were here before, to renew that commitment, and for those of us who are new to show our commitment to evidence-based policy and ensuring that, as a council, we make decisions with the needs of um, our children, the county's children um, in mind, future generations, as, in fact, as per our health and wellbeing strategy, as was previously referred to. There's cross-party recognition of this. Um, Lord Deben of the Climate Change Committee was emphasising this very, very clearly just, uh, just the other week. So I very much hope that colleagues across the floor will um, vote, as we did in March 2019, to unanimously support this motion and renew our commitment to action on the climate and ecological emergency. Thank you all.
Thank you, Councillor Jones. I understand, Councillor Harvey, are you seconding? Uh, yes, I am, Chair, and I'll, uh, I'll speak at the end if that's all right. Very well. Yes, thank you. Um, right, I've got Councillor Hamblin and then Councillor Stark, and then, there, and then Councillor Highfield and then Councillor Lishurst, and I'll stop there at the moment. Thank you, Chair. Well, Councillor Chams has already used most of my words, <clears throat> but nevertheless, I'd still like to say, yes, I think of this very much as a renewal of our existing commitment. I think Stop. the aims Stop. and objectives Stop. enshrined in this are, are laudable, and as such, it has my support. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Stark. Um, thank you, Chair. Speaking as chair of the Scrutiny Committee on Environment Sustainability, I do welcome this motion because I think it gives fresh impetus to the declaration we made in 2019 and further added to in 2020. The danger with declarations, Chair, is that they get tabled, agreed, and then forgotten about. So I'm glad that this has come up, and I can assure Councillor Chowns that we are looking very seriously as part of our work programme at um, how progress has been made within the Council and across the county on net zero as well. So I do welcome the fresh impetus this motion provides, and I will support it fully. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Stark. Councillor Highfield. Am I on? You're on? Yes, I'm on. Uh, Mr Chairman, uh, I'd like to support this motion as well. I note that from the, uh, the detailed wording of the motion, uh, paragraphs A, uh, D and C, uh, C and D seem to uh, cover the whole county. Uh, and as we know, the uh, government's commitment is 2050 for the nation as a whole. But I don't see why that should limit us. The council is already committed to net zero by 2030 for its own activities. And I don't see any reason why we can't commit to doing our very best to achieve uh, net zero for the county at an earlier rate. Um, 2030, if we can manage it, we are not bound by the government telling us we don't have to bother until 2050. Thank you very much. I have Council Swindlehurst next, and then Councillor James, uh, and no one else, and, and then Councillor Stone. So I'll stop there. Councillor Swindlehurst, James, and Stone. Thank you, Chair. Um, so Ca Councillor Chams very kindly um, did ask me to second the motion, and were I not a member of the executive, I would absolutely have done that, and I'm grateful to her for reaching out across the political divide. Um, this is not a political issue, it's a humanity issue. Um, the other day, Councillor Simons and I were um, doing the climate awareness running out of time event as it came through Hereford, doing the, the short leg between the courtyard and the Kindle Centre. And as we, as we walked this our small <coughs> bit of the great relay from Ben Nevis to Big Ben, uh, I reflected on what a good metaphor it was uh, for the way that Hereford Council should approach both the climate and ecological emergencies. There are no winners, it's not a competition, it's a relay year upon year, building on the efforts of the past to create a better future. The Heritage Council began to address the wider environmental challenges as far back as 2003, with the first uh, carbon budget written in 2011, and by the start of 2019, uh, progress had been substantial, I think around about 42% reduction of our emissions. And the baton then is passed to uh, the, 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 the new administration, and they've continued that journey. They continued, they did their leg of the relay and have passed the baton back with further reduction. And we've got further reduction as well this year, but I can't quantify that. I'm still waiting for the report. But, it's, but we are on that journey. We are on track to get to uh, the 75% reduction by 2025 and net zero by 2030. Uh, Councillor Highfield raised about the, the, the county uh, target. There is a county, county target for, for 2030. Um, and we're working with partners to, to, to try to get there. Um, however, we can't just sit back and imagine that all will be well if the council gets to a target. It won't. We need every household, every business, every individual to do their bit, and the council can help. And we've got grants to improve thermal efficiency of buildings. And so as members, you can help by reaching out into your communities. If someone's in fuel poverty, if they're struggling, signpost them to these grants. Um, we, the, the, so everyone has to do all that they can do. Um, although the motion doesn't specify adaptation and resilience, uh, that's something that I've got very, very clearly in, in focus, because what 
what we have got to do is be prepared for what is likely to happen, mitigating the impacts of climate change. Um, we can see from the news bulletins that we're no longer dealing with climate change, but with climate changed. And we need to rise to that challenge together. So in honour of Councillor Bowen, and in conclusion, I'm going to quote from uh, Shakespeare's Troilus and Cressida. One touch of nature makes the whole world kin. Take but degree away. Untune that string and hark what discord follows. And I hope today that we find a small degree of harmony in this room. And I support this motion. Thank you, Councillor Swindlehurst. Um, Councillor James, would you like to follow that? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Can I say I wholeheartedly support this? I, I, we're at a crossroads. We always say this at various times. And over the last month or so, I've been slightly depressed yeah, about the situation that's been happening, that uh, there's been a, almost an attempt to row back on these particular issues by, by the two main parties. But I'm also heartened by the fact that within the Conservative and Labour Party, there are people that have responded to that challenge, to that, to that policy. <coughs> you know, which wouldn't have happened <coughs> a year or two years ago. I think now people realise the depth of the problems we've got as far as the climate is concerned. Most of us sitting in this room probably won't, won't be around when the, I don't mean on the council, but around, literally around when this is resolved. But we have to move in that direction and as quickly as we can. My only concern is the fact that we are limited but as a council what we can do. Um, what, what needs to be done is much bigger than the, even this council. So I do hope, I do hope, and I, as I say, I've gone from being rather depressed about this but a month ago to being slightly more hardened by the fact that um, politicians within the main parties have suddenly had the courage to come up and say, you know, we can't go on like that, trying to gain political advantage, a short-term advantage on this issue is no good at all. No good for us, and no, more importantly, no do, good for our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren in generations to come. We've got to go, get, get on with it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, now, I've got Councillor Stone and Councillor Kenyon. I've got no others indicating, and at that stage, I will then go back to Councillor Harvey to second the motion, and then back to Councillor Chance. That's my, that's my proposal. Uh, Councillor Stone. Uh, thank you, Chair. I very much support this motion. It's a renewal of a commitment which we, many of us voted for um, several years ago, as Councillor Chowns has said. Um, and just think what we achieved with the LED street lighting. It shows what can be achieved in meeting some of our um, targets, and we can do this on other things as well. Um, one of the local reasons I support this motion is because of the flooding we've had in Herefordshire in recent years. The flooding in my own village of Brimfield, for instance, in 2007-2020, we were told by the planners at the time it was a 100-year event. This is clearly no longer the case. and We've got to face up to this with all our local uh, planning decisions. So I feel we must all work together towards achieving these targets, difficult though some of them may be. And the wildfires across <laughs> Europe this week show how much needs to be done both internationally, nationally and locally. So let's support this motion. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Stone. Uh, Councillor Kenyon. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'd just like to uh, go back to my days when I served the armed forces and apologise for setting fire to Cyprus, both north and south, and causing <laughs> an international incident. Um, I, I'm generally supportive of this, but there's just a few things that... Um, it, I've got a few questions. Does it make it more difficult to build houses? Will uh, house builders still come? People already can't afford housing. As a council, can we offset, can we help, can we support, can we give funding to people that want to buy houses? I don't want this to be a tool that stops things. I want it to be a tool that enhances things. So please keep this in the back of your minds. Um, and we do need to stretch outside of here. I mean, we could, we could reduce things and everything that we do, but it's, it's the wider world that I think is the bigger issue. So um, I welcome this. Um, but let's not use it to stop things. Let's use it to enhance things. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Chen. Right, I will now call on Councillor Harvey to second the motion, and then I'll go back to the proposer of the motion. Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, it's, it's hugely heartening to hear the unanimity that there is in this room 
in support for this notice of motion. Um, a little bit like rene renewing one's wedding vows, re renewing the vow that we had, that we made uh, to this climate change um, uh, challenge, um, I think is timely and well made here for a new council. Um, it's, uh, as a council, we are walking our talk in terms of the action that the council <coughs> is taking to demonstrate it is possible. If the council can do it, our businesses can do it, and we can help them to make those changes. It's heartening to hear that there are government grants available that the council can help to distribute to help households and businesses to make those changes. Um, and we all have a massive community leadership responsibility in helping people not to be afraid and not to, be, not, to, not to feel that this is too big a challenge for them to make the changes in their own daily lives that will make the small but together large contributions to changing the way we use energy, um, we do business, we live our lives, and how we care for this delicate planet. Uh, flooding, yes, is a clear manifestation for us here in Herefordshire. Um, I think we've all recognised that even over the last few years, we have had very different weather patterns. We may not have more rain falling from the sky, but the timing of it and the quantity of it is different. And that is washing more soil off our fields, into our streams, blocking our ditches, changing the ecology, um, and damaging our communities where people find that their homes are um, damaged by water ingress um, and they're no longer able to get household insurance um, and it leads to all sorts of problems. So we see it on a daily basis and it's really important that we get behind um, renewing our vows um, and Councillor Kenyon, it, it's never cheaper to make um, housing energy efficient and carbon neutral than when it's being built as new. It's a fractional cost at that point compared to the kind of cost mm, that's associated with uh, retrofitting. So I'm really heartened by the comments that have been made by across parties in this room in the debate, and I really look forward to uh, another unanimous vote. Fingers and toes crossed. Thank you. Thank you. I'll now move, go back to the, uh, the mover of the motion, Councillor Chans, to sum up the debate. Councillor Chans. Thank you, Chair, and I'm, I'm heartened by the fact that your pen is green. Um, <laughs> I just noticed. <laughs> you, you just thought I threw this together, didn't you? You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yes, I, I'm, I'm likewise really heartened by the cross-party support from this. And to extend the analogy, let's say <coughs> hold hands across the aisle. And um, I'd like to call for a named vote on this, just so that we all have the opportunity to, you know, renew our vows publicly on this issue. Um, and thank you, colleagues, for your support. Uh, could I have eight people to indicate they oh, yeah. want a name vote? I, that, that, looks like, that looks like eight to me. Very well. Now, for those, this will be the first time we've had a name vote. What's going to happen is that the monitoring officer is going to read out the names alphabetically. So, Councillor Andrews isn't here, so she's, she, which is a great, which is a great pity because she was always normally the first one to give everybody the indication how to go. Um, uh, but uh, you will, you will be asked. Your name will be called out, and then you will ask either for, against, or abstain. Is that clear? I think it'll probably be pretty straightforward, but so, so wait for your name to be called out and then call out either for, against, or abstain. Monitor and officer. <coughs> Councillor Baker. Councillor Bartlett. Councillor Bartram. Councillor Biggs. Councillor Bolter. Councillor Bramer. 
Councillor Carwardine. Four. Councillor Chowns. Four. Councillor Cole. Four. Councillor Cornthwaite. Four. Councillor Crockett. Four. Councillor Claire Davis. Four. Councillor Durkin. Four. Councillor Dykes. Four. Councillor Fagin. Four. Councillor Gandhi. Four. Councillor Gennard. Councillor Hamblin. Four. Councillor Harvey. Four. Councillor Heathfield. Four. Councillor Highfield. Four. Councillor Hitchner. Four. Councillor Herkham. Four. Councillor James. Four. Councillor Kenyon. Four. Councillor Lester. Four. Councillor Mason. Four. Councillor Matthews. Four. Councillor O'Driscoll. Four. Councillor Oliver. Four. Councillor Owens. Four. Councillor Pebbody. Four. Councillor Phillips. Four. Councillor Dan Powell. Four. Councillor Price. Four. Councillor Proctor. Four. Councillor Simmons. Four. Councillor Spencer. Four. Councillor Stark. Four. Councillor Stodart. Four. <coughs> Councillor Stone. Four. <coughs> Councillor Swinglehurst. I do. Four. <laughs> 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 Councillor Thomas. Four. Councillor Tillett. Four. Councillor Toynbee. Four. Councillor Alan Williams. Four. Councillor Robert Williams. Four. Councillor Woodall. Four. Thank you. That's unanimous. unanimous. Completely yes. unanimous. That is completely yeah. unanimous, so that motion yes. has been carried. <laughs> Um, can I thank, uh, that concludes the business of the council meeting for today. Can I thank all members of the public who have stayed with us during this time? Uh, also to thank all of you as councillors for your attendance today at today's meeting. I would also like to express thanks to the support officers who have been with us today and also to the technical team who have been next door. Um, and uh, as I said to them, uh, if everything goes right, we would we would almost forget about them, but I think it, it has gone pretty well, so our yeah. congratulations to them as well. I would remind you that the next meeting is ominously on Friday the 13th of October at 10 o'clock. Thank you all for your attendance and your forbearance with me. Hopefully I'll be 100% next time. Thank you all very much. I declare the meeting closed. Excellent.